for those who are already here, um, introduce Dr. Verenga. Dr. Verenga is a fetal medicine specialist from uh, Zimbabwe. He's the head of unit in uh, Paralanyata Hospital and also in the uh, University of uh, Zimbabwe. He was trained by the world-renowned Kapros Koladi from UK. Uh, so today, without uh, wasting time, we will want him to start immediately because we just have only an hour. He has been waiting for you. And I know the whole of Limpopo has been waiting for you and the whole of South Africa has been waiting for you and the Southern Africa has been waiting for you. Just to say, we also have some um, delegates or participants from Zimbabwe and Botswana who are joining Dr. Verenga. And Julia, I know she's also part of the team joining us. And, you know, so it's just the whole world meeting to get today for this hour. We are so excited. Dr. Verenga, you can go ahead, say. You can. Um, th thank you so much, Dr. Dakalo. To be honest, it's humbling to, to be introduced the way you've introduced me there. But um, what excites me most is the, is the opportunity to, to share with you guys uh, what I consider to be my passion. Um, and this passion for me was born out of my interaction with Professor Kipros Nikolaides. Uh, I think he's the man who, who has defined my, my path and career and who has made me change how I see the world vis-a-vis uh, -vis the issues of women's health. So to just briefly introduce uh, myself, Dr. Dakal has already done a wonderful job, but I want you to know that uh, I'm with the University of Zimbabwe, um, which is the biggest university in my country here in Zimbabwe, and um, I'm also uh, I'm also a co-founder. Um, I mean, I'm the founder of the Fit Amazing Foundation in Zimbabwe, which is affiliated with the Fit Amazing Foundation, uh, which is based in the UK. Um, I I work, I'm the head of the two units, one is Parvenya Twa, the other one is Salim Gabi, the Fit Amazing units, which we opened in 2019, February of 2019, the first of their kind in Zimbabwe. My passion is fetal medicine and um, obstetric ultrasound. My wish is to see that every pregnant woman should be managed like they belong to, 19, to 2020, not to 1970, where there is a lot of guessing in terms of where the placenta is, where there's a lot of guessing, whether it is a breach or a kephalic. So for me, teaching ultrasound is a passion which, which is burning strong inside me. So thank you so much for taking time to, to listen to this talk. Um, I would like to thank the leadership of Limpopo, Dr. Dakalo, for making this happening and the rest of the leadership there. Thank you so much for giving me this time um, to, to teach on obstetric ultrasound. This course is a basic course. There are th what you call three to four levels of ultrasound. That is level one, level two, level three, level four. I teach all the four levels of obstetric ultrasound, but this is a very basic course. So I'll try to keep things very as basic as possible. Uh, but however, if you do have questions, if you want to know more, at the end of my presentation, you are free to ask questions in terms of, uh, based on what I will have presented on. This is the outline. The next two slides will be a pre-course test, which I want you to, to take right away. Um, so find a piece of paper, write it somewhere. Where is the placenta on the image on the left and on the image on the right, where is the placenta? And again, what is the abnormality you are seeing on those placentas? So in 30 seconds, just write what you think. Where is the placenta? Those two black and white images. Okay, the other one is purple, we colorize it. It's purple, but where is the placenta in those two images? And what are the abnormalities which are visible on those images? We'll come back to these images at the end of the presentation. The second one again, where is the placenta for the image on the left, which is black and white, 
uh, black and gray. Then the other one, which is purple, there, where is the placenta? We're talking of placenta position. So just write on a piece of paper what you see on the images, whether you're able to identify the position of the placenta. Right, so let's get going. So for a start, uh, we should know how ultrasound is generated and how we end up with an image. Um, we, we do have a machine, which most of you probably have already seen that is an ultrasound scan machine, which may look like an old television, most cases, or a modern television, but there is a machine where we have these structures seen here attached, and these structures are called probes. They are called probes. So we can see that they are probes of different color. These probes, you call them endocavitary or transvaginal probes. Sometimes they are called transrectal, depending on the specialty, but our specialty call them transvaginal probe. Uh, that is both midwifery and obstetrics. It's called transvaginal probe. Then we have these other probe, which we, we may call surface probes, depending on where they are used. They may be used on the chest, but the probe that we use commonly is this kind of a probe, which in this case, these are volume probes. But most of the probes you may see on your machine, they are not volume probes. They are curvilinear probes, which are used for abdominal scanning. Um, what is important on this probe is to know that underneath the skin, they are what you call piezoelectrical crystals, which are arranged in a longitudinal fashion so there are piezoelectrical crystals inside the probes. Modern ones are made of this uh, synthetic plumpium zirconium titanate, but they are arranged in the same way. And the probe is, is the most important part of the machine. If you drop the probe, you have destroyed the machine in a way because everything that you see on the screen happens at the level of the probe. So the piezoelectrical crystals which are within these probes, they are stimulated by the electrical energy generated by the machine, and they do vibrate. When they vibrate, they release sound wave, and that sound wave is the one which is transmitted into the patient. When the sound wave is transmitted into the patient, when they hit an object, um, some of the wave is absorbed. That means it goes through that object, some of the wave is reflected. Some of it is scattered. The one which is scattered is lost. The one which is absorbed, when the, when the images come back to the, to the probe again, because the ones which are reflected, they come back. The ones which are absorbed, where the, the whole image, the, the sound wave is absorbed, there will be nothing to see on the screen, or there will be an echoic kind of appearance. An echoic means black. So if it is black like this, that means it's unequic. As ultrasound is passing through this structure, all of it is passes through, none is being reflected back to the probe. Then when ultrasound, his structures, such as bone we see here, it is reflected back to the probe to construct the image. This is what we are seeing here as a white kind of appearance. We call this echogenicity. So this is echogenicity. So this is a hyper quick appearance. For structures that do both, some structures will allow ultrasound to be absorbed and also to be reflected. Structures that do both will give us what we call an iso quick kind of an appearance. This is what we see on soft tissue. So just from this talk which I've done here, the message is that ultrasound travels differently in different uh, structures. Ultrasound travels in fluid easily. All of it is, goes through and is none is reflected. While on bone, most of it is reflected. This is why we have this whitish appearance we see when ultrasound uh, hits the bone. So this is how an image is reconstructed by the ultrasound scan machine. So the returning echoes that reflected ultrasound is what we call returning echoes. So the returning echoes are the ones that construct the image that we see on the screen. 
So ultrasound is different from imagery. It's not the same as taking an image. So that means if there are any impediments between the probe and the structure that we are going to examine, this is going to affect the quality of the image that we see on the screen. There are certain structures that will not allow ultrasound scan to pass easily. We're talking of bone, we're talking of fat tissue. So that means if a woman has a lot of fat tissue here, the image quality is going to be poor. Um, so ultrasound sound wave itself, there are different kind, kinds of sound waves. The, ones, the one which you are hearing right now as I'm speaking, it travels at this kind of speed between 20 to 20,000 hertz. But the one which we use for ultrasound for medical diagnosis is greater than one, medical, or one megahertz here in terms of frequency. The one which you cannot hear, which we call infrasound, is the one which is greater than 20 hertz. So for medical purposes, we use sound waves, which is greater than one megahertz in terms of frequency. The other important bits of the physics of ultrasound is also to realize that ultrasound travels poorly through corners. So when you look at this, baby, this baby's head, you can see that there appears to be a defect here. The re reason why there's a defect is that when ultrasound is being emitted by the probe, it doesn't travel on corners, it doesn't take curves. So that means this part here is being missed by the ultrasound and it's not being reconstructed when the retaining echoes go back to the probe so for the machine to reconstruct. So it will appear as a drop down effect. It's because ultrasound doesn't travel on corners. So don't mistake this for a missing part of the skull of the baby's, uh, or, or missing part of the baby, baby's skull. It's actually part of the physics of ultrasound that it doesn't travel on corners. So in terms of ultrasound, um, basic physics for scanning, um, this is what you need to know about ultrasound. The other, the other issues to do with the physics and the nobology, I'll emphasize it as I'll be showing you the videos. Then to, to just go through some theory work. So let's talk about the placenta because it's one of the most important structure that anyone who scans should be able to identify and also to describe or to. All right. All right. Okay, so probably I, I'll just continue. So. So when you are looking at the placenta, what are the indications? For every scan we do, we want to know where the placenta is. We also want to know the placenta position in relationship to the cervix. And we also want to check the position of the placenta in emergency rooms in women who come with bleeding in pregnancy. We also want to know the placenta in cases we have had a previous cesarean section so that we can identify morbidly adherent placentas. We also want to know the placenta, the placenta in terms of chorionicity determination in multiple pregnancy. The technique for identifying the placenta, there are two techniques. We can do it via the transabdominal route using that transabdominal probe which I showed you. We can also do it via the transvaginal route using the transvaginal probe. The transvaginal route normally applies to the placenta which are low lying. The moment the placenta is low lying to correctly characterize its position, we need to examine from down below, which is the transvaginal route. So from the tummy, when you position the probe in the sagittal plane, I'll show you on the demonstration of the videos which I have. Uh, when you position the probe on the sagittal plane, you want to start right on top of the pubic bone, just above this, just on the suprapubic area, then with a slight tilt into the pelvis to visualize the fetal bladder, which should be half filled in this case. So it should not be an empty bladder. It should not be too full a bladder. It should be a half-filled bladder when you want to characterize the position of the placenta, more so if it is low-lying. So we want to visualize both the blood and the cervix. 
And um, when you move the probe, we'll be able to see whether the placenta is low-lying or not, and we'll also be able to measure its relationship to the internal os. Um, for the placenta, which is on the upper part, all we need to do is to slide the probe in transverse fashion along the abdomen to visualize whether it is posterior or anterior. For the lateral placentas, we need to put the probe in the parasitical plane and also move up and down, as I will show you on the videos. Then for the transvaginal examination, uh, I want you to know that transvaginal examination is safe even for women who are bleeding and for those who, have, who are known to have placenta previa, it is safe to do transvaginal assessment of the placenta. Uh, in terms of the orientation, I'll show you the orientation uh, in, in video when we do the gynecology scans. Um, it's better to, to, to show you rather than to just describe how it is done. Then in terms of position, this is to show you an anterior placenta, how, how it, it looks like. I've outlined it on this image to make it easy for people to identify it. So this is the probe we have here. This is trans transabdominal scanning. So this is the woman's tissue. This is the uterine wall. Then we have the thickened part here, which is the placenta. We can see that it's quite homogeneous in appearance. And this is amniotic fluid. This is posterior uterine wall. And this is part of the baby. So this is an anterior placenta. We are saying it is anterior because it's closer to the probe here. If it was on the other side, like it is now, it's now a posterior placenta. This is the anterior part where you are seeing the probe position there. And this is the posterior part. So this is a posterior placenta. Then in terms of relationship to the cervical os, one of our patients here, you can see this is the transvaginal probe. And uh, this is the anterior wall of the cervix. This is the posterior wall of the cervix. This is the cervical canal. So this is the internal os, where the, where the cervical canal, the internal os is, where the two anterior and posterior wall are meeting. And this is the placenta, which we've got there. So the, this is the lower tip of the placenta. So when you measure this distance, it was 17 millimeters. So this is a low-lying placenta. Then we have another case here where we are seeing the placenta here, which is a placenta previa because it's touching on the os. The moment it touches on the os, it becomes placenta previa. Um, most of you did midwifery or obstetrics at some point. Uh, most of our books have this kind of a classification where you are being told that the placenta is high or a slow lying, it's marginal, it's partial placenta previa, it's in the major placenta previa. I want you to know that this kind of classification was based on physical examination of the patient, uh, whereby a woman would come in labor with an open cervix and on obstetrician or a midwife would put a, a speculum with a speculum and a, a torch. They would look at the body membrane and see that there's a piece of the placenta which is probably halfway on the, on the open cervix. But in modern day practice, where there is now sonography, where we are able to scan, we scan women who are not in labor and we identify a placenta position. When the woman is not in labor, the internal also is just a point. It's, it's a point, it's not open like this. This is already an open cervix. It is just a point. So you cannot say it is partially covering a point or marginally covering a point. So in modern day practice, we do not report this kind of classification, but this is the classification we use. Either the placenta is a high, high placenta, or it is low lying. Low lying, that means it's two centimeters away from the antenna os, or it is placenta previa. All these kind of classifications are just placenta previa because this does not change how we are going to manage the patient. If the placenta is marginal, the de delivery by normal vaginal delivery is contraindicated. If it is partial, it's contraindicated. If it is major, it is contraindicated. So this is all placenta previa. Again, this is the placenta here covering the internal os here. That's the internal os, that's the cervix. You can see a nice anechoic 
um, uh, cervical canal there. This is a transvaginal assessment. And here we have the placenta covering. Then in this case, our internal os is about there. And this is the canal. And you can see that this is about 14 millimeters away from the internal os. And this is a low-lying placenta. And this is previa. Then in terms of placenta appearance, when you are looking at the placenta, what is it that we want to look at? So this is the placenta, a posterior placenta. We are saying posterior because the probe is there. This is the uterine cavity, and this is the back of the uterus. So this is a posterior placenta. So when you are looking at the placenta, we want to look at the appearance. A normal placenta should have what to call homogeneous echogenicity. Homogeneous, that means it all looks the same. The structure looks the same to the human eye. It all looks the same in terms of its texture appearance. So that's how a normal placenta should look. Then we should measure the placenta um, to see whether it's thick or not. We don't do this routinely, but in all high-risk patients, most of those complicated with preeclampsia or abnormal fetal growth, we measure the placenta to see the thickness. A normal placenta should measure less than four millimeters. Four, four, four millimeters. The moment the placenta is above four, four centimeters, sorry, it's four centimeters. The moment the placenta is above four centimeters, then there is a problem in terms of the placenta being too thick. Then we also look at the retro placenta space, which should be anechoic and um, should not um, have any echogenic material in it. Then placenta grading. In first trimester, the placenta is just a very small thickness um, on the uterine wall, and you normally call this a grade one placenta. In second trimester, we see a homogeneous appearance of the placenta with some moderate echogenicity, and you call this um, grade two placenta. The echogenicity is just slightly above that of the myometrium, which is here. Then in third trimester, what we see is a loss of homogeneity. Homogeneity, that means it's no longer looking the same. Different parts of the placenta are looking different. Some are appearing a little bit whiter than others. So this is what we are seeing there. These are calcification. We call this punctiform calcifications. And you can see the retro placenta space also. There are calcification there. This is what we call a grade three placenta. It is normal late in third trimester to see a grade three placenta, but it is not normal to see a grade three placenta in second trimester and early third trimester. That shows that the placenta is accelerated its maturation and that means there is an element of placenta insufficient in those cases. Then in terms of current necessity determination in multiple pregnancies, which will be a topic on its own on, in these courses, but it is important to note that the placenta is very important to look um, in a multiple uh, pregnancy, especially where the two placentas are draining. We want to see how many layers are there. What you are seeing here is the chorion, which is part of continuation of the placenta tissue is the chorion and the membranes which you are seeing sort of opposing on the chorion is the amnion. So in dichorionic diamniotic, we are going to see that there is an amnion that is early in, uh, in early gestation uh, and there is also a chorion which is separate from the amnion. In third trimester, the amnion and the chorion are fused, but what remains is a piece of tissue between the two uh, chorionic uh, uh, membranes here, and we call this a. We use it to diagnose dichorionic, diamniotic twins. Then, for monochorionic, uh, diamniotic twins, we, we will not have a chorionic uh, tissue because what is coming together is just the amniotic uh, membranes. So we see the two amniotic membranes coming together there, and there's no chorionic tissue. In, in late gestation, we can see them fusing together with no placenta tissue going in between the membranes. This is what we call a T sign, and we use this to diagnose monochorionic diamniotic twins. It's very important to, to, to distinguish the two types of twins, as you will see later on during the, the evolution of this course. 
Then these are the com common placenta pathology which, we, which you should be aware of that you could have placentomegaly where the placenta is abnormally thick and placenta previa I've already mentioned. Sometimes you may see these lacunas uh, or legs, placenta legs in tetra mesa. They are part of normal variant if everything is okay, but if they do exceed 40% of the placenta tissue, they may be associated with poor fetal growth. Um, Lacuna, they are normal in third trimester. They are not normal to see in first and second trimester. These babies will need a follow-up. Then we, we may have um, tumors, such, such as uh, hemangiomas, on the placenta as well, where there's increased uh, blood uh, supply to uh, vascularization of these masses in, in pregnancy. Then I'll go through amniotic fluid assessment. So in terms of amniotic fluid assessment, uh, we do it as part of routine examination. We also want to do it in high-risk pregnancies, such as preeclampsia, diabetes, congenital malformations, and in cases where the membranes have ruptured. So in terms of how we do it, um, this is the probe you see. That's the skin. And this is the uterine wall. And where we are putting, that's the amniotic membrane. And this is the placenta covered with the amniotic membrane. So we measure from amnion to amnion, the deepest pool in this case, and we make sure that our measurement is not cutting across the limbs, any of the limbs, we are not cutting across that. So there are three methods of doing it. We can do the amniotic fluid index or a single deepest pool, or we can do what we call experience performance assessment. We use the single deepest pool because it's easier to train and it's also easier to do and quicker to do uh, because we work in a high volume center. So to just describe this, uh, these me methods, for the amniotic fluid index, for the uterus, which is beyond 20 weeks of gestation, we divide the abdomen into four quadrants and we scan each of the quadrants looking for the deepest pool and measuring each of the deepest pool in the four quadrants. And the summation of the, these four is what we call the amniotic fluid index. So when we are doing the, um, the amniotic fluid assessment, we should make sure that the, the probe is always vertical to the horizontal surface so that we don't falsely um, increase um, the amount of fluid you are measuring if we are oblique. So we should make sure that the probe is always perpendicular to the horizontal when you are doing it. In terms of the findings, if there is no fluid at all, we call that anhydramnios. If the fluid is less than five centimeters, it's oligodramnios. It's between, if you, if between five and 25 centimeters, it's normal. And if greater than 25 centimeters, it's polyhydramnios. That's the, 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 the amniotic fluid index. When you go to the single deepest pool, which is the method we use in our units here, uh, we search for the single deepest pool using the same technique as the four quadrants, but in, instead of measuring the four quadrants, we just measure one quadrant, which is the deepest pool. And this is the interpretation of the findings. Anything below two, two centimeters is oligodramnios. Between two to eight centimeters is normal. Greater than eight centimeters is polyhydramnios. So you can see in this case that this was normal because it was 64 millimeters, which is 6.4 centimeters. And you can see the measurement that it's a vertical measurement from amnion to amnion. And there is no fetal parts cross, uh, cutting across the measurement or any of the baby sleeves or the umbilical cord is not within uh, the measurement. So there are special cases which you have to, under, uh, to understand that before 20 weeks, it's not possible to do amniotic fluid index. So in that case, you can just measure the right and the left deepest pool or just do the single deepest pool, which is quicker and easier to do. Then above 20 weeks, we can do the amniotic fluid index if you want, but most of our trainees, we just encourage them to do the single deepest pool because these two methods, they mean the same in terms of screening scans, which are done at the level of the basic uh, obstetric ultrasound. Then in multiple pregnancy, we do not do the amniotic fluid index, but we do the single deepest pool for each fetus. Then this is the normogram of the amniotic fluid, how it changes with gestational age. The message is that the peak of amniotic fluid happens around 32, 34 weeks. Then the amniotic fluid starts going down. Um, as we progress in gestation. 
So it's important to, to know that there is a normogram. The amniotic fluid is not the same throughout the session, but it changes with the gestational age of the, of the pregnancy. Just to show you two of our cases here, this is oligodramnios. You can see that this measurement was 15 millimeters, 1.5 centimeters. Forget the mislabel here. This is the cinemagnal label. Forget about that. So this is just the distance there. So this is 15 millimeters, which is less than two centimeters, which you said if it's less than two centimeters, it's oligodramnios. You can see that the placenta is abnormally thick. So there was placentomegal here and some and also oligodramnios on this case. Then we have polyadramnios. This is the single deepest pool, which measured 130 millimeters, which is 11.3 centimeters. So this is polyadramnios. Cervical assessment, uh, the indications are risk for preterm, uh, screening for, for the risk of preterm birth, and also uh, preterm labor, and threatening miscarriage, and antipartum hemorrhage. Uh, this is an illustration of the measurement of the cervix. This was a transvaginal uh, measurement from, for one of our patients there. So you can see the internal osses here and the external osses there and the unechoic cervical canal. This is the anterior cervical wall, posterior cervical wall, and that's our probe there. In terms of the technique, how we do it, there are two techniques. We, we just use the transvaginal for all our patients, but we are aware that some senders may not have a transvaginal probe and they may, they may need to do it transabdominally. So for the transabdominal ex, 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 uh, examination, you should make sure that the, that the bladder is half filled, not fully filled, half filled bladder, and the probe should be sagittal, as I'll show you on the demonstrations. And you should incline the probe into the pelvis until the bladder is visualized. Then the cervical canal echo should also be visualized. This is what we are seeing here. That the cervical canal echo there. We are seeing sometimes it's hyperechoic, sometimes it's anechoic or isoechoic. As you can see here, that there's a thin film of anechoic uh, cervical uh, canal echo there. Then we measure from the internal os to the external os the cervix length. So the bladder should not be overfilled. If it is overfilled, you are going to press on the isthmus here and forcefully elongate the cervix. Then for the transvaginal route, it is opposite. In the transvaginal assessment, we want the bladder to be empty. If it is not empty, then in this case, there should be just a little amount of fluid in the bladder. And then again, the probe should be put in surgical plane in terms of the transvaginal probe, which I will demonstrate in the future courses. Then the anterior and posterior cervical wall should appear to have the same thickness so that you, that way you make sure you're not putting too much pressure on the anterior wall. If you put too much pressure on the anterior wall, you will for, um, forcefully elongate the cervical canal and um, forcefully lengthen it in terms of the measurement. So we measure from the internal os to the external os the cervical length. You can see that these two were normal. This was 35 millimeters and the other one was 29 millimeters. This is the normogram of the cervix. In other words, you are saying, how do you know that this cervix is normal? You can see that there is a trend towards physiological shortening of the cervix in pregnancy that um, at 18 weeks, the fetus central of the cervix around 37.5 millimeters However, at 37 weeks, it's around 30 millimeters, and the 10th sandal, which is the lowest, is around 25 millimeters. So what does this mean? What this means is that any cervix which is below 25 millimeters, irrespective of gestation, is a short cervix. But beyond 37 weeks, we are not worried if the cervix is less than 25 millimeters because we know that the pregnancy is 10. So any cervix which is below 25 millimeters, irrespective of the gestational age, is a short cervix, and that, that puts the woman at, at increased risk of preterm birth. This is an illustration of, uh, of some measurements of the cervix. This is a transabdominal again, 35 millimeters, this is 29 millimeters, just showing you how a normal cervix should look like. Then this is one of our patients again who came with what you call funneling. Funneling is a process of shortening of the cervix before the cervix is fully open.
some shortened as a funnel. You can see the this pictorial representation there that there is some opening which is happening to the cervix, and the measurement was very short. It was about 12.9 millimeters. So this was a short cervix, and this was 21 weeks. So this was a short cervix, and we had to do rescue circulation on this lady there. Then this is an open cervix. So you can see posterior wall, anterior wall of the cervix, transvaginal probe there, with the membranes already bulging into the vagina there. So this was an open cervix. Then here we have another shortened cervix with a very big funnel here, and very little of the cervix up left, six millimeters of the cervix still holding. And this was 22 weeks, this one was 23 weeks. So this is the role of assessing the cervix. And this was for routine. These women didn't come with any symptoms. They were women who had just come for a routine anomaly scan because we offer routine cervical length assessment for, for, for more, all of our patients. We were able to pick up this. This is the effect of a full bladder. So if you are going to examine a patient with a full bladder, so you can see that this bladder is going to press on the lower part of the uterus, which is the isthmus, and forcibly elongate the cervix so that we are not able to identify where the internal os is. So this is not recommended to measure the cervix like this. Even to assess a low-lying placenta transabdominally, because you are going to forcibly, um, to forcibly diagnose placenta previa if there was a placenta probably ending somewhere there, yet the os is down there. Right, so now I'm going to take you through how to do the scan. These are images which I recorded for the purpose of this uh, talk. So first of all, we need to, to know the machine. Most of the machines that you probably will use will look more or less like this. This is just to show you that before you do a scan, you press on the button. And when you press on the button, the machine will require that you put in the patient's ID, the patient's name, the first name of the patient, and also the date of birth and uh, the date. You can interchange here. If you click this button, it can give you the option to put the woman's LMP or the woman's EDD as a way of knowing how far the pregnancy is. It is important that this information be put. If the patient has already had a first trimester scan, then you need to use the due date, which is based from the first trimester scan. If the patient already had an IVF, it is important that you use the due date from the IVF to date the pregnancy so that you know how far the pregnancy is and also so that you can control the fetal growth. Then all machines will have some buttons of some sort. So I'm going to take you through the knowledge of the machine. So, right. So these are color, color Doppler buttons, which I'm pointing to there. The other one is for pulse wave. Uh, you, you, you will see the demonstration of the pulse wave. Let me just come out of, the, of this point that's not working nicely. So, right, visible, right. So here we go. So this button is the depth and the zoom button. Some machines will have it separate. Some will have it together like this. So you just have to press it to go in between, to go to, 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 to move from one to the other between depth and zoom. The depth button, what it does is that it controls the depth at which you are going to be scanning. So that means for, for a baby who is very small, you may need a shallow depth. For a baby who is big, you may need a more depth. You will see as I'll be demonstrating the scan. The 2D button, that's equivalent to the B mode button in most machines. So this is the mode in which you do most of the scans. It's called the B mode uh, button. This machine is a 4D, probably that's why it's written 2D there. So the set button, that's your ender button. If you want to, to make any measurements, you have to press the set or the ender button. Some machines will have the ender, some will have the set button. So when you look at your machine, you're going to see either the ender or the set button. Then we, we also have the, um, the freeze button. So if you want the image on the screen to be still, you press the still button, the freeze button, which we 
we are seeing the, this is the freeze button. Then of course, these are the pulse wave and the color flow uh, uh, map buttons. And this is our, um, our mouse. The roller ball is our mouse, which we use to navigate. And of course the depth and the zoom buttons. I'll be showing you how these buttons work as I'll be scanning. So yeah, so that's the set if you want to do any measurements, right? And these are, to, these are to change the screen. If you want a dual screen, a single screen, you press these buttons here, and this will adjust the depth or the zoom by rotating that button as you see there. This is a Toshiba, so those with the Toshiba, you, you find this very useful. Then this is to measure, if you want to measure, the, to, to, to store the, the images for the videos, is the clip store, for the uh, still image, the still store, to store the images. Right, the update button, when you are doing the Doppler and you want the machine to start recording, we press this update button there. Then this is for the print button. If we want to change our measurement, we just press the measure edit there. And um, to measure, we calculate the calculate so that we, we go to the presets uh, to pick up head circumference or BPD we press this calculate button. If you want to do a manual tracing, press the trace button. Um, and this to change the scale and the angle. You see all these buttons um, in motion as I do the, the scanning. Then this is to, to just focus. If you want to focus your images, that's the focus buttons uh, we see there. So this is the nobology of the ultrasound. You will find these buttons on most of the machines and how they work. And this is like your mouse, the roller ball that allows you to move from one place to another. Then we, we do have the probes, the trans abdominal and the uh, trans vaginal. Our, our probes are volume probes, but some, some of the machine may not have volume probes, but it's all the same in terms of how things work. So if we have a curvilinear probe uh, and a, uh, a trans vaginal probe that are not volume, this, the fact that they are volume means we can do 3D if we want, but the scanning for 2D is all the same. So there's no difference between your probes you might be having and these probes, except that this can do 3D, 4D. But these are the, the probes we are seeing there. So this is the probe we use to scan from the tummy. If you are going to scan from the abdomen, you use this kind of probe. probe. If you are going to scan from the uh, vagina, you use this kind of a probe. We put it into the, into the vagina, this probe. We demonstrate this when you do hands. In terms of the probe orientation, all probes have got a mark. So this is the mark on the probe you are seeing there, I'm, I'm pointing to. So this probe is for lateralization so that you know whether this is the right or the left uh, of the patient. And also whether you know this is the superior or inferior part or the upper part or the lower part when he is coming. And this probe, this sign on the probe corresponds to what is on the screen there. So this is a Toshiba. If you are using main ray, there'll be an M there. If you are using a Voluson, there'll be an S10 or a so and so for this, you, you will see on some of our images. So that's that's it. That, this, this mark corresponds to the mark which I'm pointing to the probe. So this mark allows you to position yourself so that you know that the right side of the patient corresponds to what you are seeing on the screen and the left side corresponds to the left side. We scan with the left hand because we are fit our medicine, we want to do procedure with the right hand. So we scan with the left. So you will see that our right, the, the patient lies facing the screen so that she can also enjoy the action. So our right side of the patient is to our right. So that's the right side of the patient you see on the screen there. So for those who scan with the left, so that means this probe should be on the other side and you should always orient yourself to the, how the woman is lying. I'll show you the next images. Um, then for the next images, this is how we position the, the woman is the same position you saw me there. So right now for positioning the woman, you can see the woman is looking toward the screen. This is the right side. This is the left side. And this is how we expose for scanning. You just go below the pubic bone, lower exposure, then just up here on the breast line. This is how you want to expose for scanning more so in third trimester because the baby is somewhere there, the upper part of the baby. So you want this whole area for scanning. 
Then in terms of how you, you spread the gel for scanning, so before you have unfrozen your screen to scan, you should spread the gel throughout the whole tummy. Uh, like, let me speed up this, right? Right, so we spread the gel throughout the whole tummy. Make sure the gel, the, what is the role of ultrasound scan gel? Ultrasound doesn't, so if you don't put gel, there's going to be darkness on the screen. You're not going to see anything because it travels poorly on air. So the role of the gel is to take care of what you call acoustic impedance. So the gel is to remove the thin film of air on the woman's abdomen so that ultrasound, which is being generated by the probe, can pass through. So you can use ultrasound scan gel. In one of our machines, we use oil, uh, we use paraffin oil. Uh, it has been working for us for years in one of our hospitals. Uh, in desperate situations, you can use water. We don't recommend water because it quickly dries up and you begin to see shadows on the machine. But this is out of sun scan jelly, so you can see spreading there throughout the whole tummy because I know that I'm going to be scanning this whole area. Right, so, so there we go. Then, um, so this is how you prepare for the examination and this is how you position the, uh, the lady for examination. Make sure you are communicating to the lady and make sure the lady is comfortable before you start scanning. Now we are going to the probe movements. What are the initial probe movements you want to do when you are scanning? Um, you position the probe transverse on the woman's abdomen, starting right on the, uh, on the suprapubic area. You move the probe. We call this slide in the probe on the broad axis, going up, up the abdomen. So you do this kind of movement. Look again. Now I'm going the parasagittal plane again on the parasagittal plane. Doing the slide in the probe on the broad axis. We call this slide in the probe on the broad axis. Then now this is what you are seeing. My action is giving me that kind of an image. So I'm scrolling through the uterus. You can see I'm cutting cross, seeing that the baby is alive. I'm seeing the placenta there. Baby is thigh bone, right? We start all over again. Here we go. Here we go. So that the baby's head, which I'm seeing from scrolling from down there. Here we go, cutting across. We are seeing the baby's heart, the baby's viable. Just this one movement gives us a lot of information. There is the placenta right at the back there, right? So we call this sliding on the broad axis. And these are your initial movements when he is coming. Just to repeat again, these are very important major movements. Here we go, sliding on the broad axis. Then you go on the side, you slide again on the broad axis, right? Then you go on the other side. Most of the information you need for basic evaluation of the baby, you will get it through these major movements, right? So here the baby is kephalic, because starting right at the, we are seeing the head, right? Right there, we are seeing the head. When you are starting right at the, at the pubis, so this is a cephalic baby who is longitudinal because you are seeing the whole baby is who are doing this measurement. Look again. All right, look again. So there's the head. So this is a cephalic because the head is presenting first. Then you go all the way. We see the baby's heart in the thorax. There is the heart beating. And we see the thigh up there. So this is a cephalic presentation with a placenta which is posterior. And uh, it's a single tone from that uh, scroll there. So we, we got three, all this important information and you can see that there is what appears to be adequate like just by glancing because you can see there's amnitic fluid there. Just these three measurements will give us all this information. Now we are sliding on the narrow axis. So when you turn your probe 90 degrees and you can see the probe is now facing the other way. So that mark of the probe should be facing downwards not upwards, because you disorient yourself from the mark there. So let's do this measurement, this movement, together simultaneously. So you can see we are cutting across. Again, we see the placenta easily there. There's the placenta at the back. We start on the side again. This is on the narrow axis. Movement on the narrow axis, going throughout the, the abdomen slowly, seeing structures. 
So with, with these two measurements, we have done a quick evaluation of the baby. With this measurement, we are able to tell the presentation, we are able to tell the position of the placenta, we are able to have a rough assessment of the amniotic fluid, we are able to tell the number of babies which are in the tummy. Just these two measurements, sliding the probe on the broad axis and sliding on the narrow axis. Right, so we move on to the, to the next movement. Right, so now this is the other movement which is very important. It's called the rotation of the probe. Look at that. So this is the rotation of the probe. When you turn the probe 90 degrees on its axis, it's called the rotation of the probe. So we are rotating the probe, right? And, right. That's the rotation of the probe. What does it do to your image? So look, this is the longitude now from transverse view. So we are cutting the baby transverse. So if you want to see the longitudinal view of the baby, you can see the spiny longitudinal view there when you rotate the probe. So this is called the rotation of the probe. You see the, the longitudinal view and the transverse view because we are rotating uh, the probe. Then when you go to the next image, see the next image, let's see. Now, we call this angulation of the probe. Look at that. That's forward angulation, backward angulation. Again, one more time. This is forward angulation of the probe and backward angulation of the probe. What does it do to your image? For, for an image which is oblique, this is what angulation does. So you can see that the midline is not where it should be. So, so this is what the movement does to the structure you are looking for. That's angulation of the probe. Right. Right. So the next mo motion, this is called dipping of the probe. So I'm dipping to the left, dipping to the right, left again, dipping to the right. We call this rocking or a dipping of the probe. These measurement movements are very important when you are evaluating the baby. What is the use of these measurements or of this movement? So if we want to take the femur, we can see that this femur is vertical, but we want to horizontalize it so that we can do the measurement. So I'm going to apply dipping. You can see I'm applying dipping to horizontalize it. So I'm dipping toward the side, which is, which is the deepest here. So this is how we horizontalize vertical structure if you want them to appear horizontal for measurements. So this is called dipping of the probe, which you are seeing happening. This is how we horizontalize the baby's femur bone there. That's the femur horizontalized now for measurement. Then if we go to, right, the next movement, which we have to be aware of, this is sliding across on the narrow axis. What sliding across on the narrow axis does is that it allows us to send the image so if we have an image which is on the side and you want it to come to the center, you slide on the, on the narrow axis. So you are sliding across on the narrow axis to center the image, to bring the image to where you want it to be. It's called centering the image, right? So these are the major movements you do across the woman's abdomen to center the image. Right, so, sorry, I'm almost where you want to be. Depth correction, I was showing you how depth corrects images. I adjusted that same button which I was showing you on the machine. You saw what happened to this image, that this image was scanning this image in it originally. Right, so we adjusted according to the size of the baby and we are now scanning up to eight centimeters deep depth. When I started, we're scanning to almost 12 centimeters depth. Then we adjust it so that the image is bigger and closer to the screen. Because in obstetric scanning, whatever image you are evaluating should fill at least two thirds or 75% of the screen. Look at that, look at that. Adjusting the depth to make it bigger, more visible, easier to, to perform measurements. Then fetal viability, which is the last slide. 
So in terms of fetal viability, uh, once we have identified the heart, we press the pulse wave Doppler, then with the pulse wave Doppler just below the fetal heart, we can trace the measurements, as you can see there. So these are the measurements. Uh, th these are the, the Doppler tracing, pulse wave Doppler, and we are able to measure the heart rate and know what the heart rate is based on this tracing. So that's fetal viability. Thank you. That, that was my last slide. Um, before I finish, I just want to go back to the post test, to the post test again. Um, so you can mark for yourself on the post test, just mark for yourself. So here, if, we, if you say that this placenta could be fundal or it could be lateral placenta, you are correct. Because whether it is a fund or lateral placenta depends on the position of the baby or of the probe. If this probe was on the sagittal plane, held sagittally, that is on the narrow axis plane, this would be a fund or placenta uh, if we're in the funders. But if you are holding this probe um, on the broad axis plane, then this is a lateral placenta. There is an anterior placenta there. But together with the placenta, there is what you call an accessory lobe or a bilobe. So this is the abnormality we see there, that there is a bilobe placenta, anterior placenta there with an accessory lobe, which is poorly communicated with the placenta tissue with the other lobe there. So this is a bilobe placenta. Then here we also have placentomegaly because this placenta is measuring more than 40 millimeters or four centimeters. Then we have an anterior placenta. This is an anterior placenta. If you manage to say anterior placenta, you are correct. And here again, we have a posterior placenta, which you are seeing there. So that's a posterior placenta. I think this, this brings to the end of the first session uh, of the introduction to obstetric scan. Thank you so much. I'll open the room for questions and I'll, I'll give it the time to the chair to, to lead the question segment. Thank you. Marvelous. This was well done, Dr. Berenga. I've been monitoring the questions and uh, the chat. It's like everyone is so excited about this. I don't want to take any more time. I want to open it to the floor to people to ask questions. Uh, I would ask Dr. Um, De Jong to please take over and uh, uh, moderate this uh, session question. Uh, because we don't have a lot of time, Dr. Ver uh, uh, Dion, can you go take, take over, please? Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Mohava. And I'd like to echo your feelings. A wonderful presentation. Unfortunately, my slides don't have the questions. So would you mind asking the slides, please, Dr. Mohava? All right. Ask the questions uh, because my, my, my screen does not have the questions. Okay. So the, most of the questions which I've been monitoring, they've been asking, if we can able to get this information online, if we miss something and want to like just go through again. Yes, we are, we will put this on YouTube as well. And also if you want your own copy, you can ask for, uh, from uh, Pelvic Floor Foundation, we'll give you the, um, the website. Um, but uh, there is no specific uh, question which is jumping in right now, but the, the, the sentiment is that people would like to have this kind of a talk uh, at their own leisure to, the, to be able to go through it again. Um, Dr. Dion. Thank you very much indeed. Um, can I ask a question of my own? I know we only have one more minute. Does it matter which machine you use or are all machines suitable for doing basic obstetric ultrasounds? Dr. Varenga? Thank you so much for the question, Dr. De Jong. Uh, it doesn't matter. For, for basic obstetric ultrasound, it doesn't matter. If the machine has a screen and a probe, it doesn't matter at all. For basic, Good. because we said this is level one old ultrasound, so it can be done by any machine. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. And I hope that the people online do have machines available at the clinics because the um, 
great use of the machines is undisputable and undeniable. So from that point of view, I'm not sure Dr. Mahal will be able to tell us if all the clinics do have ultrasound, working ultrasound machines available on the yes. labor wards. Yes, um, majority of our hospitals, before we do this um, a program, we have actually gone and asked the CEOs and the clinical managers, and most of them actually have better machines in a, a district hospital, in a peripheral hospitals, and they are very expensive. They were using it for fetal heart, just to check if it's a fetal heart or not. You know, so uh, yes, we do, majority of them have the machines, but if there's any of the hospital out of the people who are connected and they don't have, uh, this Limpopo obstetric response team will be uh, working for that as well. So they can actually send me the details and then we can follow it up. But as much as I know is that majority or, or almost all the hospitals which are dealing with obstetric uh, women, they have the ultrasound. Thank you very much for that. Yeah, I have a small question here to the audience. And um, whoever has the fast fingertips will win an, um, a charger, a mobile charger, and I, we will send it to them. Uh, they can just send the uh, address, right? I've got three questions. Uh, it's just yes or no. Um, the first question is, uh, the placenta is usually heterogeneous. Yes or no, just, uh, just answer, just type. And then the normal placenta is usually about four millimeter thick. You can just answer yes or no. And then the last question is the punctiform calcification is normal in second trimester. So whoever can do that while in the last minute of this presentation can send the answers quickly, quick, quick, just say yes or no. Then I will send, I will take the first, the first test and then I'll, I'll send the uh, mobile charger to them. And then we can just get the details of where we should send that mobile charger. Uh, it's a beautiful one. I'll show you while you're, you're, you're answering. So it's something like this. I don't know if you can able to see. Uh, it's a beautiful one. It's new and it works perfectly well. Um, so we will send it to you if you have got the answers right and you have sent us your address. Dr. Dion, before we close. Yep. I'd like to just quickly say I'm looking forward to having um, a webinar on Wednesday afternoon and as many people as possible must come along because we're going to be talking about the safe cesarean section techniques. So it would be wonderful if as many people as possible can be over there for that webinar. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Mahaba. Beautiful. Dr. Varenga, uh, your Do last word, please. We Sorry, Dr. Really, Dr. Carlo. Really... Yeah, boy. Sorry to interrupt. There is a question on the Q&A that says, does the pulse wave have any danger to the second trimester fetus? All right. Dr. Varenga, did you hear it? Yes, I did. N not at all. Not at all for second trimester fetus. It, it, has some, it, it, it has some danger in first trimester. We normally don't want to use it before 10 weeks of gestation. After second trimester, it's fine. When you ask coming, uh, probably something which I'll emphasize next week when you do biometry, that you should always be checking what you call the thermal index on the machine, uh, which which sort of tells us the amount of heat which we may cause to the to the to the to the woman's body uh, by performing Doppler scans. But in second trimester is safe because the amount of time we expose is very short, and we do not generate enough heat to cause any cavitation. All right, brilliant. I was trying to look at the person who won. Uh, can we save it to the next? Uh, we will be able to give you the person who won on the next presentation with Dr. Dion um, on Wednesday next week. Is, is that correct, Dr. Dion? Is you That's give you quite right. I yes. look forward to meeting you on safe cesarean section techniques. And there's lots brilliant. of videos and things, so it's going to be very nice. I enjoy. I look forward to seeing you all there. Lovely. Thank you so much, everyone, and thank you for joining us. We really appreciate your time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.